The Cappuccino Podcast brought to you in association with Tactical Solutions. For all your tactical solutions, check them out at www.tactical.co.nz. It's that time again, so grab yourself a cup of joe and get ready for the Cappuccino with Constable Brian. Last week was Money Week in New Zealand. Money Week is Money Week. It's the annual public awareness and engagement campaign conducted by Tiara Ahanga Ora in partnership with Financial Capability Community. The campaign's purpose is to work together to do help demystify money to lots of people. The theme Just Wondering is back for its final year to help keep the court at all going on money questions. And the focus is on encouraging people to talk more openly about money and ask for help. Because let's face it, any money question is a good question. So. A number of the Cappuccino people have contacted me and said, now that'd be an awesome podcast topic. So given those requests, it's my great pleasure to introduce to the Cappuccino podcast, Helen Skinner, the Head of Responsible Investment at ANZ to the Cappuccino podcast. So congrats, Helen, on being the subject of an awesome podcast before we've even started. No pressure whatsoever. <clears throat> <laughs> Thanks, Brian. No worries. So some of Helen's previous experience in the investment world. Well, currently she's obviously at ANZ as the Head of Responsible Investment. She's been the Head of Emerging Wealth at Craig's Investment Partners, Senior Manager Client Services at Trustees Executors Limited, Senior Investment Relationship Manager and Head of Australian Business Developments and Asia Pacific at Newton Investment Management based in the UK. So, before we begin though, I've got to throw in the disclaimer because it's talking about finances and money and everything else. So here we go. Please note, the information and topics discussed in this podcast are general in nature and not intended as financial advice. While care is taken to ensure accuracy and reliability, the information provided is subject to continuous change and may not reflect current developments or address your personal situation. Before making any decisions based on the information or comments provided in this podcast, please use your discretion and seek independent guidance. Again, the whole concept of the Cappuccino podcast is two people having a chat and possibly a laugh about an issue, a matter about their life or maybe their career, and you are lucky enough to be invited to listen into the conversation. And once again, thank you to all the listeners for your continued support. So, now that we've got that all the way out of the way, Helen, let's go for the speed round dedicated to Keanu Reeves, because Keanu Reeves is the man, John Wick, Bill <laughs> Hare, blah, blah, blah. There is no way you can argue it with me. Right. So, our uh, last book read was what? Oh, um, or current book read. I'll current book reading is Becoming. Um, which is uh, Michelle Obama's book. Okay, right. Yeah. Uh, you'll be buying the journal very shortly afterwards, and I'm sure. Um, <laughs> now, you've been overseas quite a bit during your career, so what's your favourite New Zealand moment when you were overseas, that moment when you went, you know what, God damn, I'm proud to be a Kiwi. Proud to be a Kiwi. Um, there's been multiple moments of that. One of those moments where I thought, oh my gosh, I am a Kiwi, is when I bumped into someone I went to school with on the tube. Nice. That, that's happened to a few people over there. But um, proud to be a Kiwi usually involved the Olympics yep. or some sort of sporting event. Going to the 2012 Olympics was pretty amazing and seeing our All Blacks and people over there. Nice. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, one trend or fad that you just don't get? Oh, I'm getting to the stage now where I don't understand some of the language. Okay. Right. <laughs> It's FOMO, it LOL. Yep, all good, no worries. Um, worst purchase ever? Um, oh, it's bound to be some clothing in there. I've got a substantial wardrobe. Right, okay, cool. Uh, childhood idol was who? Uh, I was obsessed with Tom Cruise. Yeah, okay. I, I know, I broke that's, my toe over him. At least he's <laughs> stayed the distance, I guess, so that's all good. Yeah. Uh, and I, I was going to say a choice of brew, but I know what that is because it's a cup of tea with, as you refer to it, plant milk. So, let's get into the questions. Uh, let's say, right, now I often look at the stock market reports, like some people look at a cricket match report, you know, silly mid off, uh, you've got the square leg, you've got the boundaries and everything else, and if you're not familiar with the game, you have no idea. You know, kind of know who's winning, but the rest is a little bit hit and miss. Yep. So for those who are interested in learning how finance and investment works and everything else, what's some of the best places or books that they can go to 
to get a basic fundamental knowledge of how it all works. So I think one of the best places to go to is to have a look where you've already got some kind of relationship with with a company or an organisation. Mm-hmm. Um, like if you are in KiwiSaver, as three million of us are, there'll be heaps on usually on your provider's websites. Um, sorted.org.nz is a really good source. They have some awesome um, uh, videos, YouTube videos as well. And so, so do the uh, Financial Services Council. And they've got a, a YouTube um, channel called Money and You. And they're yep. also on Instagram with that as well. So I'd have a look for reputable sources. Okay. Um, yeah, and go from there. All right. So how did you get started in investment? Because let's be honest, there aren't many children. And I have, uh, how do I put this nicely? I'm not being horrible here, but there aren't many two children who go to school and go, you know what, when I grow up, I'm going to be an investment banker. So how did you get involved in it? I fell into it, funnily enough. Yeah. (laughs) Um, I had a bit of a strange sort of start to my career, I guess, because I, like many young people, I had a bit of a mental resilience moment in between high school and university. Mm -hmm. So I went to uni and I actually um, dropped out after six months and ended up starting to work and went into a job in life insurance and kind of worked my way up through there. So that kind of gave me the exposure to investing and understanding that sort of thing. And then I went, I went to the UK and got into full investing and Boom, there boom. you go. Right. So I've heard you mention in a previous podcast that you did enjoy figuring out how the world ticked and what part your money played in the world. Yeah. Uh, do you think sometimes people forget that their money's actually doing what their money's actually doing for all of us? rather than just looking at the straight returns in a dollar sense? Because, yeah, yeah. is that something that you think sometimes people just lose complete track of? Yeah, they do. Um, I think it's also people understanding what it is that they're actually doing. Like KiwiSaver, um, a lot of people think of it as being a bank product, so they think of it almost as being like a cash product. But actually, when you're putting money into your KiwiSaver, every little amount, they generally go into shares, where Mm -hmm. you're buying like a little portion of a company, of owning a company, or a bond, which is where you're lending money to a company or a government and they pay you interest for it, or cash or something like that. So everything that you are investing is going towards um, the investment universe in lots of different organisations all over the world and lots of different companies which we have exposed to in everyday life. Yep. So, like, you know, you have your phones and you have your cars and everything else. So, yeah, we do kind of lose track of that and we're not... I think we could do more to kind of expand yeah, on that. Yeah, bigger picture, possibly. Exactly. Okay, yeah. so your role, Head of Responsible Financial Investing. Yep. In layman's terms, uh, for the crayon eaters like myself, uh, <laughs> equals what? Uh, it kind of means I help our investment team think broadly so we're all about investing sustainably and Mm -hmm. that means investing for the really long term and thinking about all the different impacts so I help them think about the global issues and the local issues which might impact how we're investing and also looking at where the opportunities are for future investments as well yeah all right so what does responsible financial investing look like to the average New Zealander and why is it something that they should be thinking about or paying more attention to as opposed to 25 years ago. I mean, like I know that there used to be lots, when I was doing the research, there used to be lots of investment funds that would put money into munitions, for instance, and that mm-hmm. type of stuff. Um, I guess that's a good example of possibly, but what's some of the things that have changed in sort of um, 20, the last 20 years about the way that we look at the w- investing? I think it's really good that we're starting to look at investing, not just being about what shouldn't I invest in, yeah. but also what am I, where's my money actually going? Mm-hmm. And, and that kind of happens, I've seen around the world, that the more that people have an investment, so the bigger that your KiwiSaver pot grows, the more that you care about, or you think about actually what's happening, what's my money doing. Yep. So um, so it's not, the whole concept isn't new. Like I work for a firm in the UK that have been doing it for over 40 years. Mm-hmm. So it's been around for a hell of a long time, yep. but um, but we're kind of coming to the, to the game now a lot more as New Zealanders, which is really cool. Yeah. So uh, again, you mentioned um, in another podcast about environment, social and governance factors being massive factors in your role at ANZ, right? Yeah. So how do you keep a handle on that? Because, I mean, let's be honest, environmental, social and governance factors, that's a huge portfolio. That's almost like the only thing I'm not including in there is oxygen, pretty much. And well, even that could be included. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so, so um, how do you keep track of it all? Um, I think, well, yeah, and you add on to that that ANZ we look after about 20% of all KiwiSaver money. Yep. Yeah, so $17 billion. So, yeah, it, it is massive, and we've got a huge responsibility. But but I'm just one of a team of people. So, um, And we have 
loads of different global managers that we work with so they help us come up with and themes and ideas and I'm sort of looking at what are the big risks and what are the big opportunities that are out there yep. and then getting the team to think about that in their everyday kind of activities. So yeah. I guess as a police officer and I know that some people have contacted me and went, oh you need to ask this question, <laughs> who watches the watches? I mean what checks and balances are in place to make sure that people's money is as safe as it can be? Because look, let's be honest, we're talking finances, we're talking investments and as people in the 1929 could tell you when the depression and the stock market collapse happened, there's no such thing as a guarantee, we know that, but who watches the watches or who keeps all the governance checks going and everything else? The really good thing is things have moved on since 1929. Oh, well, I have you, literally, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, we talk about, like, like 1929, even 1987, you literally had people running around with pieces of paper to somebody else with a blackboard to say how things were buying and selling. Yeah. So when you ended up with something like a you know, a run of investments, they didn't realise for ages because it was taking so long for the message to get through. Yeah. And now it's all electronic and, you know, stock markets can just flick off trading if they want to. But generally, there's lots of controls now on customer money. For instance, um, all the customer money is kept separate and held by a different company than those guys that are making the investment decisions. And we have a supervisor and we have a regulating body as well, the Financial Markets Authority, which looks after us. So um, we also have independent audits. So there's a whole load of different checks and balances across us now. So now when I looked at the research, New Zealanders' financial literacy or knowledge isn't bad, but as Mm -hmm. lots of school teachers would say, We've got a little bit of room for improvement there. How come we're not as good as we could be? Because let's be honest, most Kiwis have that number eight mentality. They can, they're can they pretty good at picking up things. And um, how do I put this nicely um, without offending all of New Zealand? Um, <laughs> making really complex things quite simple and easy to understand. But for some reason, we can't seem to do that when it comes to our financial literacy. How come? I think we talk about number eight. We're also talking about people doing it themselves. Yeah. And that's not something that it's easy to do in finance. Yep. So you've got to ask for help and you've got to talk about it. And it hasn't naturally been a, a thing, I think, for a lot of Kiwis. So, and the other element is, you know, we don't include financial literacy much in our schools. Yep. So um, people are relying on their parents or their friends or Google. You know, your parents are in exactly the same position. They haven't had yeah. the same level of education. Um, and, you know, Googling, you just, I would say a piece of advice on that, just have a look who's actually giving you the advice yep. if anyone is telling giving recommendations to do anything they're giving you advice yeah and in new zealand you have to be a financial advisor which means you have to have done qualifications you have to be licensed by the fma um, and it's exactly the same in like, most jurisdictions around the world so have a look at the small print and see if they've got any qualifications to be saying what they're saying right so the most common themes in the research i did uh said that kiwis in particular struggle with concept, concepts like compound interest, yeah. risk diversification, and time value of money. So in layman's terms, can you explain all three very briefly for us? So the, the listener goes, oh yeah, okay, now I've got an understanding of what compound interest is. Okay, compound interest, think a snowball. So if you're investing and you're putting money in the bank, and the bank gives you interest, then it's saying you will get interest on that interest in time. So the snowball gets bigger and bigger and bigger the more interest is applied to it. Um, Risk diversification, that's the classic, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And don't, I'd say, think about where you have money exposure everywhere. So think about your bank accounts and your home and any other um, things that you own, as well as things like KiwiSaver. Um, And time value of money, that's saying that if you... Um, if I give you 10 bucks today, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, not that that's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can invest that and you could grow it, right? So you could put it in the bank and that's going to earn money. And so in a year's time, that 10 bucks is going to be worth more. Yep. So it's just saying that we just need to bear in mind that, you know, 10 bucks today isn't 10 bucks in the future because you can earn off it. Yeah, yep. not wrong. Okay, so now there is a huge divide when it comes to financial literacy rates for women, yeah. Māori and Pacifica who don't do so well in all the research I've seen. And I know that you guys have got uh, a little test where you answer sort of 15 questions. So I've got to say, I did it and I got 80%, so I was quite impressed. Boom. First time ever. Um, no. <laughs> anyway, so how do you think we can improve this as a country and why is it so bad? There's quite a few reasons behind this, I think. And uh, so the Retirement Commission did a piece on this mm-hmm. and it showed that older Pākehā men have the highest level of financial well-being yep. and the highest level of literacy. So... Um, I think part of it has come down to traditional roles Mm -hmm. in finances, which Mm -hmm. I find kind of 
ironic given that most household money globally is managed by women. Yeah. So, you know, we, we're in it. We know what we're doing. Yeah, and without being sexist about it, like uh, back in the day when your mum and my mum used to go and do the shopping and everything else, they were the ones that were budgeting at the till because yeah. dad was at work, so, you know, too busy to do something as mild and meagre as feeding his children. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah it's bizarre. My mum did that. We yeah. had a separate purse where she used to take the money yeah. out every week, put it in there, yeah. and that was paid for bills. Yeah. So, yeah, we didn't really talk about investing because we were just thinking about saving and yeah. paying the debt. Um, but, yeah, it, it is down to that traditional thing. And I think it's just a case of all of us just stepping in a little bit. Yeah. But when it comes to where there's cultural divides, we all know that we need to do better in that sense. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So generally speaking, is there a huge difference between the way that men and women invest? Yeah, and I think about this as yin and yang. Mm-hmm. So it's not yep. men and women, but it's whether you have female or male tendencies yeah okay um so and there's and thinking of female tendencies we've got some really good stuff yep. so um we tend to be more careful when we're investing we're a bit take on a bit less risk we tend to ask for advice and directions um and we tend to think about money as in what we can do with it so what we can uh, if it's going to feed our children yep. rather than it just being a pile of cash yep. and all that is really good for investors so i'd say it's not necessarily it's not necessarily that we're better than men. It's not a competition thing, but we're all no. in the game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that women lack the confidence to yep. actually say that they're good at it and to get out there and do it. So yep. that's the thing we've got to work on. Because a lot of guys I spoke to, you know, and not just in the police, but other people yeah. that I've spoken to this week, knowing coming up with this podcast, I said, "What's your retirement look like?" And they go, "Oh, you know, car or or yeah. a boat or or an overseas trip." Or, and I'm like, and after that, and they're like, "Oh, I don't know. I haven't really thought about it that much." I was like, mm, "Okay." Yeah. Um, now, you previously said in a podcast that you often saw in a previous role that you did um, in a financial advisory um, capacity that you saw women coming in in times of trauma like do- divorce mm-hmm. or death. And I have to admit from personal and policing experience, I've seen people too after a sudden loss or a, a breakup or something without any idea of how their finances work yep. or even how to pay the bills or do, um, where do I write the checks to um, – we don't even use checkbox anymore, people. Um, because their partner or their wife or their husband did all of that stuff when they were alive or when they were together. Yeah. What do you recommend for people um, so that they aren't that reliant on... I'm not going to say don't be reliant on your partners, but uh, they aren't that reliant on somebody else so that if something does happen, it's an emergency situation or something, they can actually cope with it and deal with it. I think it's natural in any relationship that we all have kind of roles, right? Mm-hmm. So yep. whatever it is, but... Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with making sure that you're still kind of included in it yep. and you're across it. Particularly if um, if you have or you're getting financial advice, make sure that you are in the decision of who that person is. Because we found often that, yeah, particularly with women, that the, the man in the relationship would have that relationship with the advisor and then... You know, the woman would be coming along and she, she wouldn't have the same kind of relationship or even like the advisor. Yeah. <laughs> so make yeah. sure that you're kind of, that you're part of that. Um, and if if that's not possible, then again, if you're if you're in a KiwiSaver or you're with a financial um, uh, provider, then yeah, have a word to them and just have a chat to an advisor. Because very often, particularly like with KiwiSaver, financial advice comes free with a product. Yep. So you've got that as an option to talk to someone and, you know, they're not trying to no. say anything, just trying to help you out. Yeah, yeah. so... Now, as New Zealanders, we can, like, we have a really complex knowledge of a game of rugby or cricket, and yeah. let's be honest, those are not simple sporting games to play. Um, uh, if I, I often say this to people, it's incredible that I can get a 43-year-old housewife from sort of Ekatahuna to explain to me the offside rule in rugby, right, but New Zealanders just don't seem to pay that much attention to their finances or investments or retirement funds. Is it just that? a thing of, oh, it's out of mind, out of sight, and I'm not going to see it until I'm sort of 60, 65, 70, or when I decide to retire. Is that the reason why? Yeah, I was going to say, don't ask me about rock and roll. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can kind of, I can follow the game. Yeah. But, and I think that's it. You know, you don't have to know all the rules to kind of be in it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, kind of think about that, like, with KiwiSaver, three million people in it, so three million are in the game. Yeah. You've got, we know there's about 40% that don't contribute, so they've kind of dropped the ball. And then we also know that there's like 80% of Kiwis which haven't had any financial advice. Yeah. And they've kind of passed the ball to South Africans and the South Africans are running over the try line. I don't know if that's too early to say that. Let's <laughs> hope you get proven wrong. Yeah, yeah. that's all good. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just that, yeah, we need to kind of 
talk about this stuff. And sometimes out of sight, out of mind isn't a bad thing. Like yeah. if you have made the right decisions at the beginning and your circumstances haven't changed, you know, you're still in the same position in life and um, you haven't had any particular changes, then sometimes you don't need to do anything with your investment. You yeah. know, it's there for years. But but you do need to check it out and make sure that you're in the right thing for you. Okay, now Treasury, this is a bit of a long one, but Treasury yeah. said that financial literacy needs to be embedded in the New Zealand culture, the same way that we know slip, slop and slap or a buckle up and a seatbelt click um, before driving our vehicles. So financial yeah. literacy is in the interest of New Zealand as a whole and the creation of a financially, financially healthy New Zealand is the responsibility of all of us, government, the private sector, community-based organisation. It's too large a task for one group of sh- stakeholders to achieve on their own. And the final result isn't to create a nation of financial experts. It's more important to equip individuals with sufficient knowledge to make sense of financial activities, seek out appropriate information, feel able to be a- to, to be able to ask relevant questions, and be able to understand and interpret the information that they actually acquire as a result. Which I guess brings me to this question: How do I find a good finance advisor? Because I've heard some really interesting financial advice in my time, you know, DIY investors, life coaches, mate, it's a sure thing. I've got this mate and he's loaded, or even better, this person's got lots of money, so they definitely know their stuff. So how do you spot the real McCoy when it comes to sound financial advice? And it comes down to that thing of, who are they now? They're licensed? Yeah, so yeah. if they're real, if they're subject to a whole load of requirements, and they've got to disclose and tell you stuff when they first go into a relationship. So, um, and that is something that, that you need to kind of think about is the payment. So if your advisor is part of your product, they'll generally be paid by the product. Yep. So they, if they're asking for money on top of that to give financial advice, then I'd take a look at that. I'm not saying it's wrong, but yep, just but some do it in different ways. Yep. Yeah. And all of them have to tell you before you enter into the relationship how much they're gonna how much it's gonna cost and how they're gonna get paid. So if they're not doing that, then yep, ask so, some questions. Something's yeah, not quite right. Yeah. Okay, so financial well-being is known by many names: uh, financial literacy, wellness, confidence, mm-hmm. or resilience. Right. And let's put it simply in a nutshell: financial well-being is the measure of how comfortably you're able to meet your current commitments and whether you should continue to do this, whether you can continue to do that in the future. So, what are some of the aspects of financial well-being that you should be looking at? to make sure that your financial well-being is where it's at. Because let's be honest, um, despite the fact you're 24 and I'm sort of in my late 40s, um, we have, we'll probably <laughs> have different... Both counts. <laughs> yeah, we'll have We'll have different financial needs as we get older. So how do you know that, or how do you kind of uh, drill down on where you should be with okay. your financial well-being? So I just want to say first of all that financial well-being is different from literacy. Oh, there you go. Good work. Okay. Nice. Yep. So literacy, right, is uh, if you think about um, using car analogies, it's about can you drive a car? Yep. So do you know what you're doing? Can you tell your Bitcoin from your bond kind of thing? It's mm-hmm. just understanding the language. Whereas well-being is that you're in the driver's seat and you're in control and you're not breaking into a sweat. So um, it's making thinking about things like um, can I pay my bills on time? And there's a lot of people, regardless of their income, who can't do that or don't know how to do yep. that. Um, and the big things are two parts of saving and investing. So do you have a rainy day amount? Um, and the government came out with some stuff last year that mm-hmm. said that one in three Kiwis um, don't have enough, say, for three months. Mm-hmm. And you're thinking COVID and everything happening mm-hmm. now, mm-hmm. you know, that's huge. Yep. So, um, and the other part of it, oh, and actually, if you put anything away from a rainy day, it doesn't matter how much it is, it's a whole lot of research that says you'll, you will feel financially more well. Yep. So um, don't think that you have to put large amounts amount away. It's not, it's not about that. Yeah, it's that age-old thing, though, isn't it? People who plan for... Um, bad things, bad, in, bad incidences or bad times yeah. generally do better than those who haven't. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and the other thing is to think about, I always think about me in the future. So I think about kind of me, I mean, right now, because, you know, I'm 24. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm thinking about me in my 70s. And yeah. I'm thinking, okay, who do I want to be? So I want to come home after my riding my e-bike, you know, on the Alps, yeah. into my little warm house. Yeah. Um, and there's a, cart, a cat in my partner's lap, and he's snoring away after a game of golf. There you go. Yeah. And what do I need to make that happen? And thinking about more, if I buy this now, am I going to love this more, or is that future me going to love that more? And it's just kind of comparing yeah. it. And, yeah. yeah. And it comes into sometimes when you're buying stuff on credit, it's that you're taking it away from that future person yeah, as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one that's always obvious to me is televisions. Yeah. People buy televisions. It's like, it's um, guys in particular, and I don't mean to be sexist, but we just do. We can't help ourselves. <laughs> it's the size of half the house's wall. Yes. We buy it for $3,000, and then in six years' time, oh, we can 
go to somewhere else and pick up a screen that's exactly the same for 300 mm-hmm. and yeah that two thousand seven hundred dollars could have been snowballing yeah. anyway yeah. yeah so okay the other thing, so Nigel Don't. Ladder made a suggestion he said remove the friction of the stuff that you want to do and add friction to the stuff that you don't want to do yeah. so make it easy for anything that you want to do more of and then you know make it harder for the stuff that you don't want to do smart man that Nigel Ladder God he bless is. right so the value of financial well-being is fairly obvious right but how do you improve your financial well-being in the short term and then in the long term I guess if you're doing it in the short term you're doing it in the long term aren't you well here you are yeah there you go yeah. there's my light bulb moment. Yeah. <laughs> um, talking about it just removing that stigma is yeah. a huge part of it talk about this with your friends and family and um, and yeah be brave about it so that if you are worried about things or even if you think oh I've done this right tell other people about it and let's get the conversation going yeah. but it's that other part of just Whatever it is that you're putting aside, even if it's 50 cents, it will make you feel better. So it's a it's a really big part. The other thing is um, having a look at, again, like sorted. There's a whole lot of budgeting tools that mm-hmm. are out there if you don't want to talk to anyone about it. So you can just go online and it's so easy to use. So, yeah, just make that first sort of step, I guess. Okay, so with that in mind, like everything, like uh, safety, like prevention, uh, road safety messages, all that type of stuff. Obviously, the earlier we start, the better we're going to be on in life. And the other mm-hmm. thing is, is, particularly with kids, is, um, and I found this through teaching safety lessons to them, is if you give them the why, then when they get to be adults, they don't have to think about it. It kind of becomes automatic, which I guess makes the next question kind of really, really um, prudent. But yeah. how do we teach Kiwi kids to be financially, well, have, have financial well-being from an early age at primary school age? How do you do it? Because I know that there's been lots of institutions and some of the other banks and such yeah. like, you know, we're going to teach kids how to save, but you can give kids all the plastic money boxes in the world and everything else. It's not really teaching them how to save. So how do you teach kids financial well-being? Yeah, because I remember being that age. You yeah, yeah. To school yeah. when you deposited it. And yep. then I got to a certain, I was about 11, and I thought, oh, I've got $24, so I withdrew the whole lot Boom. and spent it on a, something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's really about just keeping it simple for them. Yep. So we've done a, a lot of research at this, actually. And, yeah, the younger the child is, just to make sure that it's the simpler thing and, and talk about it in bite-sized pieces. Mm-hmm. Um, so, And I guess that goes for everyone. But And also remembering that some kids are just naturally savers and some are natural spenders. Mm-hmm. So... You, you, there's only a certain amount that you can you've got to sort of accept their personalities I guess when it comes to money yep. um, but one way might be to incentivize them to save so um, to make sure that they know and they're kind of actually they're the ones that have come up with the idea of why they are saving and what their sort of goals are yep. um, sometimes matching amounts for saving mm-hmm. for them as well and also just with pocket money and that sort of thing just making sure that they know why they're getting the money and what they're doing for it gives more appreciation um, we've also found with goals to help set them goals with money, but also again for them to have come up with them so they're fully engaged. And it's not just something mum and dad are yeah, telling them what to do. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And true story, there is a police officer. I won't mention any names. Who, when he signed his first professional rugby contract, turned around to another uh, All Black and went, "Pro, how many motors can I buy for that?" And when he was told, he was like, "Yeah, that sounds sweet." And we signed up. Um, the pandemic affected a lot of people's financial habits, obviously online shopping being the biggest. Yeah. According to the ANZ Financial Wellbeing Indicator, April 2021, New Zealanders appeared to have reduced their reliance on credit cards. From March 2020 to December 2020, credit card use fell from 5, 56.9% to 51.5%. And the incident of debit cards has increased from 38.6% to 407 mm-hmm. However, the report notes, notes now that there is some concern about this change because it's been driven by the rise of buy now, pay later schemes rather than the reduction of and the actual spending of money, which we don't have. So instead, these schemes have made it easier for you to borrow for everyday expenses, and there's an inherent risk when purchasing items with one click or what you and I might call payment schemes, laybys, layaways, HP, all that stuff. What's the best way uh, for people to stop the urge, and what are some of the risks um, if they do decide, you know what, actually, that jacket looks awesome. I really need that pair of shoes. If I got the shoes and the jacket, they're going to give me like ten percent off. How do you avoid the temptation? You bringing this up because I no. have a rather large shoe collection. No, I would not no. do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's all it's all about that um, removing or that whole sort of friction and non-friction thing, right? So, online shopping, it's where they make it as easy as possible for you. So, a really good trick. I do is that I put it into the basket and I leave it for a day and then I come back to it or I forget about it. Yeah. So you get that kind of instant hit of 
thinking that you're shopping without necessarily spending the money. Yeah. Um, I've got a friend as well that kind of she adds friction and she has different bank cards for different accounts. Yeah. So she has um, like a card for her household bills, for her food, and she has one for her treats. So she'll only take that card out when she knows that she's going to spend something. She doesn't carry it with her all the time. Yeah. And that kind of limits it. So, yeah, it's just thinking about, again, that you need to kind of put friction on it when there's those sort of issues happening, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so again, according to the ANZ Financial Wellbeing Indicator, there are two key drivers of financial wellbeing, active saving and not borrowing for everyday expenses. Now, yeah. not borrowing for everyday expenses is, let's be honest, a bit of a no-brainer for mm-hmm. good financial wellbeing, but it's that age-old rule of people not living beyond their means and accumulating unmanageable debt. Is that, is that what it comes down to at the end of the day? Uh, I mean, I think, yeah, as I say, it's, it's knowing what your wants and your needs are, but reality is... For some Kiwis, that's a really hard thing at the moment. Yep. Um, yeah, yeah. So, and some people do get into those kind of situations. Um, but as much as you can, it's thinking about that whenever you put anything on credit, you're actually, your, your future person is the one that you're yep. borrowing it off or you're taking that money off. So, yep. yeah. So, now if things do run away on you financially, yeah. what's the best thing to do? Because I've um, seen circumstances where it's caused um, immense harm. And trauma at home, and it's caused grief with relatives and everything else. And so, what's the best thing to do if things do start to skyrocket or go out of control, and you sort of think, mm. you know what, I need to talk to somebody about this? Where's the best place to go? Well, I I remember being in that position when I was younger, and yeah, you know, and um, and it is really scary, and it's that you don't want to talk to someone about it. Yeah, you know? it's a natural thing to think I'm going to be told off. Yep. But the reality is the first thing that any banks or institutions want to do is help you. You know, they want to help you get to a better position because they, they want you to, to pay it off if it's a debt or anything. Yeah. Uh, and I was really surprised by that, that once I was brave and took that deep breath and leaned yep. into them, that, yeah, there was a lot of helping hands around it. So, yeah. And if you, uh, if you want to go somewhere before that point, then Citizens Vice Bureau, they do um, yep. budgeting services yep. and stuff. And um, also the sort of website has budgeting tools on it and, can, and they're really helpful information on little steps as well. So, But I think the, the biggest thing is it's really important to deal with it and talk to someone as soon as you can and they're not going to have a go at you. Yeah. They're there to help you. All right, so um, active saving is one of the most important elements of financial wellbeing, according to the experts. And the Roy Morgan survey, again from the ANZ Wellbeing Indicator, found the median saving figures, which I've got to be honest, I was staggered at, stood at $5,220 per person in December 2020, which was up from 4400 in March 2020. Mm. What's the best way for the average Kiwi punter to start or restart their active saving? Because... I mean, like we've both sort of said, you know, we've spoken about COVID and the issues people have had with mental health and, okay, I've put that money away for a rainy day. We've all been in for lockdown, which you think you'd probably be saving more money. But anyway, that's another story for another different day. Yeah. What's the best way for people to start their um, active saving again? I guess that's the key point of it, isn't it? It's that old adage of just do it. Yeah. You know, um, it's uh, it, and it doesn't have to be any sort of large amount, but... You know, we talk about saving and investing, so it's that sort of short-term stuff and long-term. I mean, the really good thing is, you know, if you're in KiwiSave, you're already investing, right? Yeah. So, mic drop. But, um, <laughs> but um, yeah, the other thing is, uh, a really good thing to do, actually, is to set up two different bank accounts. Yep. So, you have, like, your super every day, and then you've got another one which you just automatically get an automatic payment set up, so it just automatically transfers things into it. Boom. And it, it can be any amount that's right for you, yep. and you'll feel good about it. So at the moment, there's lots of people worldwide feeling the financial pinch or crunch given pandemics, inflations, cost of delivering, mm. the whole lot. So in these times of the crunch, what some places most people can tighten their belts and still actively save? I guess you and I would call it maybe essentials versus non-essentials. I mean, the simple stuff. Is it a ma- just a matter of doing like, uh, okay, I'm not going to have takeaway coffees while I'm at work. I'm going to walk to places that I know I could either Uber or drive my car to. Um, I'm going to stop eating takeaways, which is a healthy thing for you anyway. But um, what's some of the real simple things you can do to ramp it? There you go. Boom. Boom. <laughs> Not just a pretty face. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the reality is everyone's different, right? Yeah. So yeah. yeah. So you've got to you've got to go through and have a look at your own kind of spending and yeah. um, and you know just spend a week or a month or a fortnight going through your bank account and just see what the bits are that you're yeah. that you're spending it on is probably the best. Yeah. But I'd go back to it again. Get help. 
Yeah. Talk to an advisor. Yeah. Talk to your, you know, your financial provider. Yep. There's people out there that can help you out with that stuff. And lots of banks have the um, sort of it's not the um, following app, but you can actually see where all your money's going and what you're yeah. spending it on and everything else. So yeah. easy for you to go. Actually, you know what? That's not such an essential. Yeah. So you <laughs> take sometimes it, shocking when you see the results. Uh, yeah, there's, there's a reason I don't look. Yeah. Um, so you've <laughs> taken up active saving and you've done okay. So what's the next yeah. step for somebody with like maybe 10 k in the bank? of savings, for instance, where's a good place to start? Because you'll be sitting on that, and like every single person, you'll be sitting there going, oh, I've got 10K, oh, I could go overseas on a trip, or I could put that towards my new car, or I could do something else, and then it's like when the voice of sense speaks and goes, oh, hang on, remember Helen and her increasing snowball, um, where's the best place for me to start? I'm not a financial advisor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I yeah, yeah. about that. Yeah. But, um, so, yeah, talk to one. Yeah. But, you know, they will, they'll sit down with you and work out, what are your goals, regardless yep. of how much you're saving? Yep. What are the things that you that you want? Short term, medium term, long term. So that's yep. like, yeah, you do you need to pay off bills? Do you want to go on holiday? How do you want to retire? Yeah. Um, and they'll also talk about how much risk you, you're willing to take. So that talks about when you see your money go up and down, how does that make you feel? Yeah. Um, and yeah, and they'll kind of work out what's best for you because everyone is different in yep. how they treat their investments or their money. So many people are of the opinion that advisors banks, financial institutions aren't really interesting, interested in helping them invest if they don't have huge amounts mm. of money, right? I didn't drive in on a Ferrari, so they won't be interested because I'm just in this second-hand Toyota. Is that true or not? This is my pet hate. Yeah. That is so not true. Yeah. Um, I have worked with financial advisors and a whole lot of people, young and old, across the industry, yep. and there are really passionate people wanting yep. to help everyone around yep. this. So, yeah, I think... Um, and also, you know, there's, plenty, there's institutions like us who offer products from really low amounts, like yep. you're a buck to invest. So it's definitely not all about big money. Yep. It's not all about, um, you know, people who may have retired and that, and that they yep. want to talk to. There's a whole range of people and also a whole range of, of people involved in the industry from young to old and all sorts of different backgrounds yep. that are there to help. So yep. not at all. All right. So there is lots of DIY investment platforms available at the moment to people like yeah. via the web and as we've spoken about Dr. Google or Dr. Wikipedia or anything else. Yeah. Many people say that's a great place to learn how to invest and have a little bit of a play, so to speak, with investment. But what's some of the risks that are associated with them if you do decide, you know what, I'm going to dip my toe in the pool and I'll have a bit of a go here at DIY investment. Did you by any chance see the FMA debate that I did on this? <laughs> so, no. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah, um, so yeah. I was on the pro get help side, right. funnily enough. But if we were talking about DIY versus advice. And... Those, um, I think about them as kind of being sandpits, that you, they're really good places to get exposure to investing and buying shares and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, quite often they don't have any advice around them. Yeah. So, um, so it's all around making sure that if you're going to go into to those sort of um, environments that you're doing with an amount that you can afford to do it with and that you are totally aware what the risks are that yeah. you're investing in. Yeah. Okay. Now we don't talk to money. Uh, to talk, talk to money about people to people about money we yeah. just go I'll get it out there in a second we talk about health <laughs> right, we don't have any problems in today's world addressing mental health testicular cancer mammograms all that type of stuff we can talk to anybody pretty much about any of those things but there seems to be this taboo mm. about money do you think it's that old thing of what's mine is mine do you think it's that thing of we like holding our cards to our chest because maybe we look at other people and go well you know she's driving a Ferrari and I'm driving a Toyota and obviously she's got her retirement and she earns like seven times what I earn, you know, that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, what do you think it is? Because it just seems really, really strange. The more I did the research on this, the more, it, like you've said before, we just need to talk about it, but so for some reason there seems to be this yeah. huge taboo and I can't figure it out. But we, I, It's really interesting, I think, when you think about that sort of financial well-being and mental health. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about mental health, but there's not a lot of people that are standing up and saying they're actually getting counselling yeah so you know you know I do I yeah. get counselling on a regular basis because I yeah. think of it like physical health like going to a doctor or a gym yeah. I want to make sure that my mental health is in the same kind of level you should just come to jiu-jitsu with me and get your face squashed <laughs> yeah. anyway I'm just saying <laughs> that's yeah. a different thing yeah um, yeah and so it's the same thing yeah with financial well-being I think yeah. we're in that same kind of boat that we like talking about it but actually owning up to it and saying hey I've got help with this yeah is a different level so we'll, we'll get there yeah but yeah it's a it's a way to go now, retirement, old age, and security in your old age are worrying factors for people in their retirement. And very often you'll hear people say, oh, I don't know if I've got enough for retirement, or I don't know where to start when it comes to investment for their retirement. 
what some of the best places to go to get things either started or to see if you've got enough in your old age because I know that there are some people who and I think this is a common uh, misconception as well as uh, let's say for instance I'm earning $50,000 now when I'm 65 I should still be having $50,000 a year which to be fair you're probably you're not going to need that am same amount because you're retired you should be yeah. playing a bit more lawn bowls or doing whatever <laughs> um, yeah so so what's the best place to go and kind of figure it all out so that you've got some idea? Yeah, and you don't need the same amount the whole way through your retirement as well. No. So yep. you start off and you still really are living a similar life, you're just not working. Yeah. Or for some people, retirement is actually just doing something different. They're still working to a degree to yep. get themselves in the game. Um, but yeah, I go back to Sorted because they have some really cool tools to work out what kind of lifestyle you need you know, or you want to have yep. and then how much you need to get that. Um, and it's, it is actually kind of shocking that um, there was Massey Uni did a piece on it that said that if you're going to live on the NZ Super, you um, can effectively, you won't be able to afford uh, any kind of holidays or trips mm -hmm. around the country and you won't be able to afford to eat meat. Yeah. And I think we've all seen people trying to survive on that. Yeah. So there are, there are amounts that they sort of recommend whether you're in a partner or not, whether you're rural or urban, um, and there's some really cool tools that can help sort you out. Yeah. That. Yeah. Good. And there's an old uh, punter once said to me, the best thing about re being retired is I look at my wardrobe and everything's absolute retro. Well, think it's, about that. that yeah, he said, I don't need to buy yeah. anything. I'm like, good work, nice work. Because our grandparents, they reused. Yeah. You know, and we don't. No, exactly. <laughs> Do they have it Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly <laughs> right. So, um, so for lots of New Zealanders, KiwiSaver is what they use for their future life and their retirement. What's the yeah. best way to ensure that you're getting the best bang for your buck? Um, when you are doing KiwiSaver and actually being able to have a look at it and everything else, is it yeah. just a matter of contacting your advisor and saying, hey, how's this all working out for me? Is it all going to be tickety-boo? Yeah, you get, um, every KiwiSaver does like a quarterly report sort of yep. thing that you can have a look at. Um, and that shows you like the fees that have been paid and what it's invested in and how you've done with it. Um, the other thing I'd say is you know, talking about that 40% of us don't actually put in any money into it yep. and we're actually losing government money with that, right? So you put in it's $1,042.86 a year. Wow. <laughs> I know, yeah. great number. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the government will give you 50% of it. So they'll contribute $521.43. So, but that's every year. Yeah. So that just keeps growing. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I think that's, that's kind of one of the elements. The other thing is making sure that whatever you're in is right for you. Yep. So the basic is if you're a conservative balance growth, the kind of risk side of it making sure that's right for you and it will change as you go through life um, and that is, is super important and then the other thing is if you do have other bits of you know value thing that you care about if yep. you want to invest in some things and not invest in others then yeah call them up ask them career now there are lots of people who say oh well you know what do investment advisors know because you know really if they're really good at their job they wouldn't be an advisor they'd be on a boat in the bahamas or you know in their private helicopter because they've made so much money through their investment and i think um there tends to be this sort of thing of, you know, like Ponzi schemes and uh, mm. Gordon Gecko Greed is Good and um, Jordan Belfort, the the, war, uh, the Wolf of Wall Street. Has that been your experience and how do you counter that argument? Because like, let's, let's be honest, lots of people just look at it and go, really? Come on. If they were awesome, they'd, you know, they're driving a Toyota. I mean, they're just human beings at the end of the day, aren't they? Yeah, I don't drive a truck. No, I know you don't. <laughs> but yeah. I certainly don't have a boat. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. They are just human beings at the end of the day. But um, but we're also people who have been in it for a long time. And yep. there's a huge amount of noise as yep. well out there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. we're kind of good at, I think, all investment professionals, all they're doing is cutting through the noisy bits and working out the bits that actually work. Yep. Um, and yeah, generally, I think... We'd, we'd do a great job with it, but, um, you know, I might be a little bit biased on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ah, look, that's all good. Yeah. Now, there are lots of people who get overly worried when they look at market um, fertility and the, the see their retirement funds and increase investments decreasing by sometimes thousands of dollars in a very short time, yeah. as most of us have done if we've looked at superannuation schemes or KiwiSaver recently. Yeah. Um, many go from growth-orientated funds to more conservative funds in an attempt to stop some of the sort of financial pain or hemorrhaging, I guess you'd say. When this happens, uh, the best example in recent memory, I guess, being COVID, when it first struck, and the market flutters a bit, and you know, it's high inflation and everything else. What's the danger of? Okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna flip it from being growth orientated to conservative. Conservative, and what would you recommend? 
So, right, it's actually normal for markets to go up and down yep. normally, right? So it yep. usually happens every seven or eight years or so. But this has been really unusual because it's been about 13 years of markets going up. Yep. And we've got a whole generation, so anyone that's under 30, who has never really seen market volatility. Yep. And I've had conversations with people who said, oh, yeah, COVID, I've seen market volatility. And I was like, no, that was a blip. Yep. You know, real, real market sort of waves is yeah. 18 months of it going on yeah. um, and that's really hard to manage and it's kind of around that whole sort of human nature right so it's human nature that people will buy when prices are high because yep. they're thinking yeah I want to get in there um, and sell when it's low because they'll panic so that's where the sort of financial professionals come in because we're trying to smooth out the waves and and avoid that kind of behavior yep. and if you reverse it that's when you end up being more successful and that's yep. so steadying the ship yep. yeah stay the course hold the line 100 yep. percent yeah so the media often dooms and glooms about turbulent markets and the effects it will have on investments and um should the average investor pay a huge amount of attention to media stories about investments because when i look at it and since i've been researching this i'm like i've looked at the different media stories and i'm like yeah but that's just today uh you know when i retire um 16 years time it's a long way away so what happens today might not be happening in 16 years time so should people pay that much attention to it or should it just be like we said before out of mind out of sight just let it do its thing let the snowball get bigger I'm not going to ask judgment on our friends in the media <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah I'd say um, everything that's kind of mentioned there are some valid points out of it yeah. um, but but we all need to link, think about how long are we in this for yeah. and um, and take it on advisement yeah. and I mean they do have a job to do as well they are just reporting the facts but 100%. I mean you know some people do need you and go oh my goodness it's going up it's going down I'm going like, to sell it um, yeah. so divest- I definitely div- saw that in the GFC yeah, yeah. yep yeah. Diversification is investment is an, an investment is a concept that a lot of people don't really understand. Yeah. Many people will just say, "Oh, I've got a Kiwi scheme, a Kiwi Saver scheme with ANZ or whoever," and that's kind of all they really know about it. So, mm. why is diversification important in investing and retirement schemes? And how do you access your funds to see where the diversification is taking place in your scheme? So, um, first of all, is to find out who your KiwiSaver provider is. Mm-hmm. I've heard a few people say it's with the Inland Revenue. It's not. Yeah. So check your email. Yeah. You'll probably be set a statement. Yeah. Um, and if you don't know, then go to the Inland Revenue because they have a list of everyone who your advisor is. Like my IR will say who your advisor right. or who your, sorry, your KiwiSaver provider is. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so every quarter, all the providers put out a quarterly fund update. Yep. And that has in it these um, graphs which show where your investments are around the world. So if they're um, in different jurisdictions and if they're bonds or equities or that kind of stuff. Um, but it, And it also shows the top 10 holdings. So you'll get an idea from that. There's no requirement in New Zealand to say how many stocks you actually invest into. Yep. There is offshore. Okay. But, um, but that's generally a good place to start. All right. So... Um, with your role of Head of Responsible Investment for ANZ, you'll be looking at lots of new markets to diversify into, Yeah. but what are some of the investments that might have been an absolute sure thing, stock staple, sort of 30, 40 years ago, and I know that you won't know any of them, but you probably read about them, uh, but now because of, yeah, because of ethics and people's uh, personal moral and social codes, we now just find completely unacceptable, there's just some things that we won't go uh, that investment fu- uh, providers would not go anywhere near for fear of either bad publicity or just the fact of if somebody had got shares of them and then they were morally sort of outraged. What's some of the things that you wouldn't go anywhere near? Well, these the days? easiest one to talk about is tobacco, but um, yep. but I think it's you know I'm I'm not sort of looking at new markets, but I'm yep. looking at what are the things within those markets that we need to be aware of. Yeah. Um, and that's that's changing all the time right and also looking at the opportunities coming up climate is a really big one that's happening Um, and we're thinking about and it's not really necessarily about what don't I want to invest in because if you don't invest in them the companies are still there they're just not then getting when we invest in a firm we are engaged with them we talk to them we vote as well on on our KiwiSaver behalf and we help them be more sustainable and better in the way that they operate. Yep. So if you are not investing in those companies, they're still doing it, but they don't have that kind of pressure on them in the same way. Yep. So it's a balance about whether to invest or not invest. Yep. Yep. Now, question for you, because I know that there'll be lots of guys who are like, oh, wow, you know, and I know of people, you know, I bought shares in Apple or I bought shares in the NBA or something else like that. Did you buy shares in Apple? No, I, I did not. <laughs> um, I got my ass kicked. So, um, so just that thing of, with lots of people, um, 
when they buy shares and everything else, it's kind of, I look at it a little bit like a fashion label. They like the label, they're buying it. And I guess it's sort of a little bit of a, a hobby for them. Um, but is there real danger in sort of buying the, to quote, to use a term, the, the sort of sexy shares? Because, I mean, let's be honest, those are the ones that probably are going to have the most um, vitality, aren't they, as they fall and drop? And, I've certainly, know. yeah, I've seen people who are buying their own shares like that and they have their own biases. Yep. So you end up with just all tech stocks yep. or all American stocks yep. or they're all kind of things that they, they own and see. And so you end up you know, not having that diversification around that. Yep. Um, you put all your eggs in one basket again. So, yeah, it's, yep. um, again, it, you know, it's good if you're doing that through one of those micro platforms that you're yep. getting a taste for it. but. If it's your life savings, then you might want to yeah, think yeah, differently. Exactly. Uh, I'm about to buy a house or something serious has happened that my savings can't cover, so I need to access my funds. Um, and what's the risk with dipping into my retirement fund? Is it something I should, shouldn't should do over a certain age? Because you very often see um, young people when they start off on a job. Yeah, 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 you know, started off on a job. Oh, I need a $5,000 deposit on my car. Mm. I know what, I'll dip into the Kiwi saver. Is there a risk behind it all? There's only four ways that you can get money out of KiwiSaver. Yep. So it's first home purchase. Yep. And it really has to be your first home, or yep. you have to be in the same circumstances as a first home. Um, or there's uh, permanent immigration, serious illness, or a life threatening congenital condition. Yep. So um, all of those, including, uh, uh, sorry, insignificant financial hardship. Mm -hmm. So they all have really strict protocols around them because it's really about buying your first home yeah. or full retirement yeah. yeah so um but i think there is an element that yeah you do need to work out what's important to you when you're when you're doing any kind of spending don't you so, yeah, yeah not wrong now is it awkward for you socially and personally when people <laughs> find out what you do for a job a little bit like a police officer i guess and they start chatting to you about a sure thing they've heard about and hey i can ask you a quick question about like Bitcoin or NFTs or something else like that. Does that happen very often? The or not? amount of time I've said get an Uber and I get, oh, what do you do? And then it's always, what about Bitcoin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I don't mind it because then I get to kind of talk to them a bit about why not why not Bitcoin. Yeah, <laughs> air Bitcoin, to the ground, yeah. Yeah, what yeah. Bitcoin actually is. Yeah, um, yeah so it is, it is quite good for that. But they, I think people also get a bit frustrated that I, I can't give them that financial yeah. advice and yeah. Yeah, tell them exactly what stocks to invest in. Yeah, there. exactly. And, there, and there's nothing wrong with that either. I mean, it's just that um, sort of professional line in the sand. Yeah, now, happy to help. Now, normally I ask a eulogy sort of base question at the end to close <laughs> the podcast out with. I know that you listen, so I'm not going to do that to you. But given our current topic, it seems only fair that I wind up with this question. So Helen meets herself at the age of 16, just sort of eight years ago almost, uh, and provided you could get young Helen to listen, what advice would you give her about her money and investing for her future and retirement? Don't get a credit card in 19 and spend the whole lot on a trip to Fiji. <laughs> yeah. um, I was not financially, I was late, a late developer when it came to me being financially savvy. So. Yeah. Um, like at 16, I was working at Decker on the weekends, earning $5.75 an hour, and then spending that money at the tuck shop on potato top pies. Yeah. So um, I'd probably say save some money, because yeah. it'll make your life better. Um, and I'd probably, if I was that age now, I'd say to my parents, can you open me up a Kiwi Saver? <laughs> Done. And with that, Helen Skinner, thank you very much for your time and your financial I'm going to say well-being advice. Um, it's been really knowledgeable. I'm hoping that all the listeners now have some idea, a little bit more, maybe it makes it a little bit clearer about the smart things to do when it comes to your money. Because look, let's be honest, there's lots of things that make the world go round, but money definitely is one of them because if you don't have anything, uh, it's very difficult to do some of the things you want. So appreciate yeah. your time. Thank you. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for listening. But please do Constable Brian and I a favour and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on the next Cappuccino podcast. Real people, real stories.